Yeah, hello, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. This is, it's been a, a privilege to be part of this, of this group. A, and what I've seen so far is extremely interesting. And I think that a, a very, very, very aligned to, to the, the things that we are learning and the knowledge that we have right now about managing a, this kind of patients in the, in the community. So I think that I'm going to end up repeating some of the things that have been mentioned previously, but I think it's good to, to be able to do like a review of the... Are you able to see the slides good or...? Yes, that's good. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So um, as, as we have been trying to, to establish like the flow of the patients in the last, in the last year and a half, a, we go from screening the patients a, from, from the, the healthcare facilities, or in this case, the Puskesmas or a community health centers that you may have in. And the most important thing, apart from the screening with the case definition, is trying to identify and triage the patients according to the severity and the, the clinical presentation that they have. No? So, once uh, the patients are screened and triaged, they are divided in different categories, as you all know about what is mild or moderate cases and what are the high risk, moderate or the severe and critical, critical patients. So in this case, we are talking about like patients that uh, are asymptomatic, mild symptomatic or moderate. You know? And those are the ones that we can consider like con good candidates to be isolated in in the community, in community shelters, and mainly when home isolation is not, is not the appropriate one, mainly because of the trying to prevent the transmission within the community and within the households, but also because the, sometimes the conditions, as you well said before, several of our, my colleagues, uh, sometimes the care at home could not be the appropriate one, no? and, and even identifying the signs of a, of severity. So uh, what are we considering? And this is extremely important from the WHO side. What are we considering mild and moderate and what is severe and critical? So when we talk about like severe and critical are patients that need normally supplement a uh, oxygen therapy and they are also having signs of a uh, respiratory distress and critical when we also are associating signs and symptoms of sepsis, septic shock, or even acute respiratory distress syndrome. So in, in the non-severe is when we divide between mild and moderate. And there, is a lot, there are a lot of questions and a lot of doubts uh, from many uh, healthcare workers about differentiating what is mild and what is moderate. So according to the WHO definition, we consider moderate a, a patient that has signs, a clinical signs of pneumonia, but doesn't have criteria of severity that is a pneumonia that needs oxygen therapy. So this classification is extremely important to categorize the patients that we can be managing at home or community. And when we have to send them to the regional hospital or to the, to the, to the main referral hospital where you can have ICUs or critical care units. So what we are recommending is that people who are asymptomatic, mild, or moderate without risk factors for severe disease can be managed in the community, at home, or in the community shelters without any kind of problem, but always with the supervision of a healthcare worker. The risk factors that we are seeing that are more prevalent in people who develop severe disease and critical disease talk about like older age, as you all know, people who are older than 60 years old, this is the most uh, prevalent population that tend to get a more serious disease. Also overweight, obesity, a lot of NCDs like hypertension, diabetes, cardiac disease, chronic lung disease, kidney disease, uh, but also neurological problems like dementia, mental disorders, um, and then immunosuppression. And recently, after reviewing several of the databases of the patients that have been treated all over the world, we have seen that also patients with HIV, uh, mainly the immunosuppressed HIV, it can also be considered like a high risk for severe disease. In pregnant women, normally the maternal age that is high, also overweight, non-white ethnicity, and other comorbidities 
it, like hypertension, diabetes, or in this case related to, to pregnancy, the gestational diabetes and the preeclampsia can make these pregnant women definitely more susceptible of presenting a severe and critical disease. So these are patients that normally, if they are presenting with moderate disease, you need to be transferring them to the, to the regional or the, or the main hospital. And if they have mild disease with these risk factors, you need to take like a more close monitoring and, and surveillance on these patients in a daily basis. So when we talked about a pneumonia and severe pneumonia is also another thing that uh, we need to be very, very careful when we are treating these patients in the community shelters, because uh, normally we need to monitor all the vitals and we will talk about that uh, later, because the differentiation between pneumonia and severe pneumonia is mainly based in the, in the respiratory rate and the saturation of oxygen that the patient is presenting. No? And what we know so far about COVID-19 is that most of the patients like, that are presenting some mild symptoms can even have like a, in the X-ray or CT scan signs of pneumonia, but it doesn't mean that they need to be admitted in the hospital. It depends on their capacity of breathing and their oxygenation. So in My the community facilities, Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I'm very sorry, but could you please, um, can you like uh, put your screens on full screen or your slides on full screen? Because for some of our participants, they said that it's still too small for them. But I guess, can... sorry, sorry. I was, I was trying yeah. to get, okay. I think this is better though. No, it's, yeah, it's. Or it's fine if it is fine if. If that's the case, then no, it should be. There this must good. be something. I think this is better. I guess. <laughs> Will it be? Um, Otherwise, let me see one second. Let me see if I can mm -hmm. do it a little bit. Oh, okay, right. I don't know why it's, it's not. <laughs> so I think for our, some of our participants, it's too small because it's kind of split. Yeah, no, 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 I completely. Yeah, I think this is much better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is much better. Yes. 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 Yeah, you may proceed. Yeah. Thank you very much, Marta. Sorry to interrupt you. You may proceed now. No, 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 no. I really appreciate that because I was feeling that maybe you were not seeing the slides properly. So that's great. But so how clear. is it right now? Happy now. Yeah, it's very clear now. So off you go, Marta. You may proceed. It's not for full screen. Uh, but it's fine now. I think it's much clearer than before. So I think it's fine for everyone else also. It's good, yes. Yeah, it's bigger than the previous one, anyway. <laughs> uh, I will be sharing anyway this, the, the, um, yeah. the slides, but yeah. I really would like to have everyone seeing it properly. Yes, it's very clear now. It's clear. I guess, so it's good now. It's Thank good. You okay. much, so, um, what we were, a, ah, yes, we were talking that a, normally in the perspective that we are managing is when we talked about treating people in the community is one equivalent to what we have already published about a recommendations of how to do the home care. The only difference is that they are not going to be treated at home. They're going to be treated in the community because of a public health a measures that are implemented in the country just to prevent the spread of the disease in the community and the households, but it's, it's based in the same, in the same principles. You no know, patients that don't have a high risk of developing severe disease. You no. Know? So um, we as WHO have published and posted and shared quite a lot of manuals and tools and bundles recently explaining what are the things that should be taken care of when you are treating someone in healthcare facilities in the community, sorry, in center of the community or in 
in home base in home based care. So here on the right, you can see there are a different links in these presentations when you see the slides that you can access to, for example, the home care bundles for a, for patients with with COVID with mild COVID nineteen. And, and these are basic recommendations about how to do, how to manage them and how to treat them. So when we are talking about like, how do we do the community facilities? You no, know, like what are the different options that we have to be able to set up these community shelters? I was very, very impressed when I was hearing before about like all the different principles that you were already following in, in the shelters that you have uh, created in the district. So, but just as a general recommendation, first of all, there is one AWHO guideline called about like community facilities for preparedness and response to COVID-19 that was developed by the EMT team and the, and the World Health Organization. And is a, is a very extensive and detailed guideline explaining like what are the kind of characteristics that we should be looking for, you no? Know? Like, First of all, what types of place? You can be using an existing place, as you were saying before, like Islamic schools or boarding schools. Then you can do temporal with tents, or then maybe construct something out of the blue and new one, or do it like some kind of mix, no? And you can see also what are the more preferred uh, structures that could be adapted to be community shelters. So in this case, we as WHO are recommending that mainly uh, these community shelters should be for suspected or even contacts that need to be isolated and quarantined until uh, they are tested and then mild moderate. And we discourage the idea of admitting in this kind of facilities people who are severe or critical. And you know that the layout of the treatment center, the, of these treatment centers are different. You know, like for suspected and contacts, the idea would be like doing a um, individual rooms with individual toilets just to prevent the, the cross-contamination. But for mild, moderate that are already confirmed, they can be sharing toilets and showers, and you can do just like more a, like a common, common rooms where people a, can, be, can be sharing the same, the same space. No? And this allows us, this kind of a structure allows us to make some kind of models a modules, sorry. So then you can start with a small treatment center and then a, you can just exponentially grow the, the different models that you need for, a, in this case, suspected or contacts or confirmed cases. So for example, I can bring you one example that we, we worked a, as, a, as a team in, in Guinea. It was like a chapiteau, like a tent, a big tent. That in the beginning, as you can see here, the interior was not divided and all the beds were together. So it was not really appropriate to our idea. And we don't share too much the idea of doing like common spaces because of the ventilation, et cetera. But we were able to develop like a plan about how to divide between confirm and suspected, how to do like the ventilation of the place, how to divide the rooms and also even dividing the rooms and the, and the toilets and showers that can be outside. So this was like the previous layout and then how it went to the, to the new layout. So a, the same thing about like, how do we do like the, we need to make sure that the staff that are working in these kind of treatment centers, these community shelters, they always have their own space, so they don't have to be sharing the same space with the patient for the risk of infection while they are working. And uh, they have like a proper place where they can get on the PPE and then later get off of the PPE to do like a good donning and doffing. Uh, another example of a uh, systems to create this kind of community centers is doing like the, the, the circle with a, a central um, working area for, for the healthcare workers and then the different rooms that are on the side and always remembering that we need to have big, good windows and good ventilation for the patients that are admitted there to try to, to not infect the, the healthcare workers that are taking care of them, but also avoiding a cross infection and mainly if you are having one area that is for suspected cases. So what I was hearing is that you already have all these communities, community shelters established. 
the important thing is that these patients are not very dependent and they don't need so much medical care, but it's important to have like a good number and ratio of nurses, cleaners, wash and IPC staff. So then we can continue having these places as safe as possible. One of the recommendations would be like having around two nurses per shift and making sure that all the patients can be seen at least once every, every shift. You know? In our latest guidelines, we are recommending that for patients that are mild, you see here written home, but also can be extrapolated to community, um, community shelters, is the patients that are mild, that normally don't have many symptoms, is more like symptomatic treatment, uh, the idea is just doing like some kind of assessment in a daily basis and some physical uh, examination and trying to identify if they present any kind of new symptom. In people who are moderate without risk factors, the recommendation is uh, taking the vital signs every, every shift, no, every eight hours or maximum every 12 hours. And that includes temperature, oxygen saturation, calculating the respiratory rate and also the heart rate and if possible, blood pressure, and mainly in patients that have comorbidities like hypertension, because we know that patients with COVID and hypertension, they tend to get quite discontrol, like decompensated hypertension because of the, of the infection. Also the neurological examination, and sorry for the super crowded slide, but a, as you were saying that it's extremely important to remember that these patients normally, what they just need is symptomatic treatment like antipyretics, making sure that they are well uh, nourished, they're well hydrated, that they try to rest, but at the same time, not promoting too much, they completely rest and trying to allow them and encourage them to go back to their normal activity. I really love the idea when I was saying before that they are encouraged to do exercise every day outside maintaining, of course, the distance of a uh, security, but that is extremely, the, that is the idea. Now we know that COVID is a disease that tends to produce thromboembolic disease. So it, we need to, to, to reduce the risk of any kind of complication that may happen in, in these patients. Also, we cannot forget about the psychosocial needs of the patient, no? like the psychosocial support, making sure that they, are, that they feel listened, that whatever need they have, we can try to make sure that is fulfilled. And as you all know, our last recommendations have been very clear about like a for mild and moderate disease, there is no approved drug or therapeutic. So you can find in WHO website and also the BMJ, our recommendations where you can see that in patients that have non-severe disease, is only symptomatic treatment with paracetamol and as I said before, nutrition and hydration, uh, but not, none of the drugs that were postulated in the beginning had shown any kind of efficacy. And also even can produce more toxicity. And if they are gonna be used, they should be used in, under clinical trials uh, studies. So uh, as you said before, in the chain and in the flow of the patients, whenever we are monitoring them, if they start presenting any kind of emergency sign like problems of breathing, severe respiratory distress, shock, coma, convulsions, a, a chest pain, and also a, any kind of sign of complication, they should be assessed by clinical staff. And mainly when they need oxygen that can go from normal oxygen to, to mechanical ventilation. Um, you have to be very careful about like the patients that have risk factors because they tend to develop in the second week of the disease more complications. So even if in the beginning they were not showing too many clinical signs of severity, you need to follow them up well because they tend to present the complications a little bit later. And as we have recommended extensively, it's like a the repetition of the PCR is not mandatory from a, for releasing from the, from the isolation a, in patients that have been confirmed. A, according to the new data about like the transmissibility and, and persistence of the virus, normally in a patient that has been asymptomatic, 
in 10 days, it should be safe for the community to release him. In patients that have been presenting symptoms, normally we calculate a three days without symptoms and then 10 days. So normally ends up being like four, like two weeks, 14 days that we recommend isolation and later they can be discharged and sent to the community without any, any risk. So we have like a very comprehensive team here in, in Geneva and the headquarters that go from case management to infrastructure, bio, in, biomedical engineers that can help you in case you want to make any kind of, get any kind of support are also getting some feedback about the structures or the layouts that you have, or also even for the clinical guidelines. So as I, we will be sharing these slides, you have here different contacts. So where you can contact with us and we will be more than happy to help and support in whatever, whatever is needed to make sure that we all are aligned with the same uh, direction and with the same measures. And also there is a very comprehensive couple of slides where you can find the links to all the clinical guidelines that we have developed in the last year and a half it, that go from how to set up like a treatment center, also clinical management, how to do a screening, triage and, and clinical assessment of the patients. And even for example, for the new therapeutics and the recommendations of WHO for the different levels of disease. So thank you very much.